Alrighty. So thank you so much for the handover there. And just to um, introduce us in a little bit more detail, my name is Louise Johnston. I'm Head of Customer Success at Phase 3. And we're joined by uh, James Proctor, our Chief Operating Officer. Phase 3 are independent HR, payroll and technology finance specialists. Um, please do come over and see us on stand C52, as we'd love to talk to you about all things HR tech, whether that's system selection, improvements to your current kit, or if you're interested in any managed services, we can help you with your tech journey. And that brings us on to um, the whole point of today's session, which is to talk about the ethical implications of AI and automation in business operations. Now, this is a really interesting topic as not only is AI becoming more prevalent in daily life, it's also starting to creep in much more now into the HR profession. And part of my role over the years has been about bridging the gap between HR um, and technology. So it's an area that can feel very, very um, sort of daunting if you're not familiar with it. And it's actually one where James and I have slightly different opinions uh, for once on the use of AI. So today is going to be a bit of a journey around the ethical implications of using uh, this new tech. So to start off, I think it's important that we understand a bit more about what AI actually is. So it's a computer science that's capable of performing tasks that typically humans could only do and require a certain amount of intelligence for. So that's things like learning, reasoning, problem solving, uh, perception and understanding of events. Now you've got your narrow AI, which basically performs a task for you. So this includes things like your virtual assistants, Alexa and Siri. Um, it can perform internet searches, facial rec recognition on your phone is narrow AI, along with uh, Facebook ads. That's recommendations coming through an algorithm. But as the technology uh, deepens and progresses, we've also got now strong AI which really is more about the ability to understand, to learn and apply intelligence across a whole range of tasks. And in time, that really will be something that is different from what we know now. So the tech is here and a lot of the vendors today will be ready to uh, show you their um, AI for their tech in any demos. So do have a look around the show today. But it does, of course, bring with it benefits and ethical issues, um, which we want to consider uh, from the point of view for your internal and your external customers. OK, thank you, Louise. So um, obviously we can talk about professions more broadly, um, but looking specifically at our profession, the people profession, um, Goldman Sachs Bank um, research suggested that up to 25% of work tasks could be automated by AI. BT announced 55,000 job cuts at the end of the decade, by the end of the decade, sorry, with 10,000 of those being replaced by AI as well. Prospects, the trade union survey found that 58% of their members would support government regulation on the use of generative AI. And our prime minister, maybe not for long, Rishi, um, said AI could be the best thing that ever happened to the human race. So there are some jobs that are more at risk from AI, and they include things like data entry assistants, coders, software engineers, IT support analysts, journalists, copywriters, and proof readers. And a question for the audience today, how many of you have had senior leaders in your organization say, can't chat GPT do that for you? So as I said at the start, it's difficult to generalize generally, but if we take the people profession, um, the CIPD did a hackathon and they called it the future of the profession. And they reviewed a report that was included there from Harvard Business Review, which suggested that HR jobs of the future might look like chatbot and human facilitator, HR data detective, algorithm bias auditor, working from home facilitator, workplace environment architect, and gig economy manager. Now, in a post-COVID world, lots of those roles were focused on business resilience, um, but also acknowledging the need to augment HR with AI. Um, has anybody been over to see Element Suite stand yet? 
If you have, you might have met Ella. Now, Ella is a generative AI tool within the HR system. And it's not just general HR questions like we see in lots of other demos, like what's my leave balance and can I book a holiday on this particular day? Um, Ella actually goes further than that. She learns about your organization and she can generate draft letters for the HR team, for example, a disciplinary outcome letter, and she can run and analyze reports. Now, the, the reason that that's different is because if you were asking your MI team, um, what's the annual turnover this year? Um, you would see a very different response from Ella. Ella would give you the the data presented as a response to your question, whereas the human might send you a report that you have to then interpret and analyze yourself. Um, and it obviously does depend how we ask these questions. But a key thing to consider in the application of AI is if we did save that 25% of our time, what would we do with it? Would we look at uh, more value adding activity that we could deliver? Or some might say that you might adopt the uh, four day working week in your organization and use the efficiency to be able to deliver that at very little extra cost. Um, customer service is often the area where we first interact with AI and we don't always know that we're interacting with AI and customer service. Um, the importance there though is that from a customer service perspective, um, the AI is focusing on answering the customer question and not enhancing the customer experience necessarily. Um, there has been a campaign recently from Nationwide Bank um, putting the person back into personal banking and they've committed to maintaining branches in the high street with an actual human that you can speak to. And next slide. Thank you. And speaking of the human, um, one of the things that I wanted to pick up on is it's probably quite a marketing um, friendly term, but the phrase co-pilot is being used a lot to describe uh, AI. So we've got the Microsoft co-pilot that helps you create your presentations in PowerPoint, LinkedIn co-pilot that's offering to write your posts for you and improve them via AI, GitHub co-pilot, Stage co-pilot, Dayforce co co-pilot. So why are people using this phrase? Really, it's it's probably because of the collaborative connotation. So you're implying that there is a collaborative assistant, you're working alongside each other, helping to navigate or manage, and it focuses on the augmentation aspect. So it's augmenting the human ability rather than replacing. If you think of a co-pilot, you naturally think of the person sat in the right-hand seat of an aircraft who's helping the pilot to fly the plane and ensure a smooth flight. Next slide. And now we start with the ethical considerations in relation to AI. So in terms of design of products, we have to focus on bias and fairness, transparency, and a focus on privacy. We have to look at user autonomy in terms of de uh, the development of products. And from a deployment perspective, the impact on employment or the customer experience, but also accountability and responsibility as an organization when using AI. So in terms of the bias and fairness, we need to ensure that AI models are trained on diverse and representative data to avoid bias that might affect users. From a transparency perspective, the AI decision-making process needs to be as transparent as possible and ensure that the end users know that this actually is an AI that generated the response and that it has limits. So if any of you have used ChatGPT, you'll see when you get a response from ChatGPT, it always gives you a response in the same way. It responds in bullet points usually, then gives you a summary at the end and lets you know if there's any limitations to its data, as well as there being a little summary next to the send button that says ChatGPT is an AI and might make mistakes. From a privacy perspective, there are ethical considerations. And as an example, if I, in an organization, um, am an employee who wants to request a copy of the maternity leave policy, for example, the bot knows that you've requested that. What does the bot do with that data? Does it share it with anybody else in HR? And does it let them know that you might have a, an impending maternity leave that you might need to cover and start the recruitment process? Some might say that that's actually quite a useful thing to know. But ultimately, did you acknowledge with the person asking the question that that data might be used in that way? So we need to make sure that we give users the control over how they interact and when. For example, with Alexa, you have to wake her up. She's not always on. Um, she's not always sat there listening. That's a really important point. And from a deployment perspective, clearly the most important thing is what is the impact on employees? Is this going to be a welcome change to the employees or something that's not welcome? And who is it that checks? Um, one of the things that we recommend is having an, an AI charter. Um, and interestingly, an AI charter will set out what AI will be allowed to do in our organization and what it won't be allowed to do. And importantly, and this is where Louise and I often have the debate, all of the above that I've just said also applies if you're developing a pro 
a product that will be led by humans. You still got to train them. You still got to explain the how and the why. You've got to ensure privacy of what they're told, and you've got to consider the impact on other employees. And there is still that privacy issue around speaking to a human. Absolutely. And I think um, just sort of taking this back a step as well, it's it's the trust that is so important for um, all of us here, uh, the humans, as it were. Um, and as you said earlier, James, uh, to think about 25 percent of tasks being automated, that does bring with it a degree of feeling uncomfortable as to where, you know, your role will be heading. So it's really important that you have you know, trust in your organisation and you know what the AI will do and what it would never do. Um, and, and just to pick up again uh, the thought of human bias officer or data detective. Uh, these are job roles which, uh, when I started my career, I, I never thought I would actually hear. Um, so it's 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 a real sort of changing time. Um, and staying with the theme of trust, um, people do need to know if they're speaking to AI or not. Um, because if you find out later on that you're working with a bot or AI, people will actually feel deceived by that. Um, even if it is just the simple question and answer, narrow AI function, how much annual leave have I got? Um, it's really important that they do know that they are using AI. Um, I think the maternity leave policy that you spoke about, James, is a good example, as that's one that I wouldn't have thought of myself, that uh, with the human, potentially there could be, um, you know, just a, a mention uh, behind closed doors or something, where, of course, the AI doesn't actually really care. So the yeah. AI won't do that. But that data is still being held somewhere. So people should know where their data is going and what it's going to be used for, as the last thing you want to do is damage relations with, with your customers. So for me, I think a lot of this is about informed consent. So people could have a choice whether or not they use AI within your organisation. It might be that they choose to use AI for efficiency, but if they do have the preference for human interaction, that should be an option as well. And there is more pressure to for more government legislation and industry regulation on this. We mentioned earlier that 58% of people um, surveyed would welcome more regulation. So I think it's an area that we do need to catch up on. Uh, some governments in the US and EU have already started to be more proactive um, and focus on AI regulation. At the moment, our focus uh, here in the UK is, of course, on GDPR, keeping users informed and having that consent and having the transparency around the use of AI. So moving on, um, does AI actually perpetuate bias? Now, this is a well-documented concern in the field. We've mentioned many times, it's it's the running theme of the, the talk this morning, uh, that transparency and explainability is crucial here, as AI isn't always as intelligent um, as it may seem. I've seen uh, videos, uh, to my delight, uh, where the AI is trying to pick up on human emotions, uh, potentially like a smile or how your eyes change depending um, on your feelings. Um, and it did get it wrong. Um, but moving away from that, AI is, of course, only as good and only as intelligent as the data sets that it's trained on. So. AI is formed on data sets. And if those data sets contain any bias information, the AI will learn that and it will, of course, use that. So if there's a hiring algorithm that's trained on data that hasn't historically favoured certain demographics, for example, it will perpetuate that as it will learn that and continue to do. So one of our recommendations is also that data sets must represent diversity in the real world to reduce bias and regular auditing and training must take place to ensure that scenarios and algorithms are always transparent to allow scrutiny and auditing um, of how decisions are made. And it is true to say, isn't it, that 
the same can be said of humans, can't it, in terms of bias? Um, you know, an unconscious bias is a, an issue that HR people are very familiar with, but also things such as the rumour mill, you know, Joe in accounts told me that Louise in HR told her that Abby in marketing told her, etc. You know, that that's bias that's introduced to humans unknowingly. I'm going to out myself as a bit of a Trekkie now, but I always think back to when I think of AI and, and the human comparison in terms of um, the Borg, if you remember those cybernetic people who were one conscious brain made up of thousands of humans that's almost like the ai in the room it's got all of the knowledge but doesn't necessarily know how to interpret it and can't share that with other people so very similar to to how humans operate really mm. and i think um, <clears throat> that sort of goes as well james when you mentioned earlier the, the term co-pilot i think that's very very clever because yeah. it does make you feel more at ease that the human is always in control but as you said you've got the co-pilot sat next to the pilot so what's the expectation when something goes wrong and um, that the pilot the human should always be the one making those decisions oh they turn the autopilot on which is an ai <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. So one of the things that is a risk of um, AI is the fact that um, data can become degraded. So if we think, for example, that somebody writes some content that says the sky is green and the AI reads that, the AI isn't aware whether that's true or not based on other parameters that it has. So the AI, the more it's told that the sky is green, will start to answer the question, the sky is green. The more content that the AI then produces that gets published the more it's then reading back ultimately we're getting into this circle of diminished capacity in terms of the actual ai now there's a way to get around that which is obviously to teach the ai more and what you could do there for example is take ai offline um, take a copy of the chat gpt data set for example and all the data points and feed an offline version with all of your content from your organization and that might be, for example, getting assistance with writing sales proposals. If you let ChatGPT or a similar product read all of your proposals, it will start to learn about your tone of voice and how you communicate with customers and what the standard responses are to questions so that you can then start to feed that with a tailored version of that. And the other key thing is accountability. So if something goes wrong with the information the AI provides, Where's the accountability there? They don't possess intentions, emotions, or accountability. Like Louise said with the maternity example, it doesn't care um, about the fact that that person has gone on maternity. But instead, we need to diagnose and fix underlying issues, retraining models, and looking at algorithm enhancement. And the key principle that will support this is um, what's known as the human in the loop process, um, which Louise, you're going to talk a little bit more about. Of course, so that brings us on to our recommendations. And James, as you say, keeping the human in the loop as the pilot of the situation is crucial here so that you've got out accountability should the AI fail. Transparency and non-bias is essential for buyers of AI. So if you want to stay the right side of the law and the right side of customers in its adoption, then the human in the loop process will support that and also support you in building the trust with your customers as well. So it's good to think about when the human will be introduced. So the AI can be reviewing and approving, but not actually creating the content here. Um, Aaron Harris, the CTO of Sage, recently launched uh, the co-pilot for Sage Transform. And as an organization, they have the AI charter, which James mentioned earlier, where it says AI will prompt the human, but it will never audit or decide on financial um, um, situations as the human will always be there to uh, make the final decision. So AI really is um, a rapidly evolving um, area through technological advances and the huge generation the huge data generated daily. So whilst there's benefits, the ethical and society issues, transparency really is top of the agenda for myself and James. 